somebody want to do me a favor and go to the Google Event Hangout page? It's just on the tutorials. Okay. Now, more importantly, <laughs> can you see my desktop? Yeah, it'll be about thirty seconds to a minute delayed. Are you there for the moment? Still my face? Still your face. Interesting. Uh, yeah, you're doing the VCA cable now. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, there you go. This is looking good. Did you share screen? Yeah. Okay, we can start. That's good. Uh, okay, so hopefully not too many people are at the other room. Well, but. I went looks like. Two people over on my All right, cool. Uh, this is what tends to happen with free classes that you don't get marks for. The attendance can drop over time. Uh, okay, so a um, couple quick announcements. Uh, sorry about the scheduling craziness. Um, so if you guys, obviously, you know where the room changes because you're here. Um, but next week, it is still running. I'm just not going to be there. Uh, Ryan, who's been tirelessly working to get you guys rooms and everything, uh, big thanks to Ryan. He has organized a project night for next week. Um, probably equally important, though, uh, is that Shopify is going to be stopping by. So Shopify is one of uh, Ruby on Rails' top uh, employers, actually. They, uh, the founder was a big fan of Ruby on Rails, still is, still a big fan of open source. Uh, I, I haven't really met him, but I've, I've heard a lot about the guy. Um, so he, he was a big proponent of Ruby on Rails' popularity, uh, still is. Today, when I ever do Ruby on Rails projects for people, uh, I always sell them on the fact that Shopify is a company that uses it. Uh, on top of being a big Ruby on Rails supporter, they are a very sought after employer. Uh, has anybody here not heard of Shopify? Don't be shy. Uh, anybody here want to work for Shopify? Okay, that's, that's pretty good. Um, yeah, they're, they're a very sought after employer because they're kind of like the Google and the Facebook of Ottawa. Uh, if you're in the Ottawa area, they're about the closest thing you're going to get to that. Uh, a lot of companies in, in the Ottawa area try to be that. Um, they've been one of the ones who've tried to be that and have been successful at it. They were as small as like 80 people a year or two ago, and now they're in the neighborhood of a, like a couple hundred employees. Uh, they just moved offices downtown. Very cool employer. They have like arcades. They have a slide that links their floors. You know, the kind of – I don't know how popular it is anymore. Um, uh, I don't know if anybody here watches Silicon Valley, but they make fun of stuff like that. But it's still a very cool environment. But more than that, some of the top developers you ever meet. Uh, really, really impressive developers. They, really impressive developers there. Um, you know, really, uh, really impressive work they do. Uh, they they had developers that were uh, not satisfied with jQuery, so they wrote their own JavaScript library. I mean, that's the kind of development they do, you know? Uh, they do a lot for the Ottawa community, even, like just for software hosting. The very first time, hey, I didn't even see you, Tucker. Uh, the very first time we held tutorials was uh, Shopify, at Shopify. They gave us the space, which was really cool. They were really into open source and stuff like that. Um, I say if you guys have the chance to ever work for them, you you take it. Like it's it, You'll definitely learn a lot. Uh, even if you're not there for the rest of your life, you spend a couple years there, I'm sure you'll learn a crazy amount there. So they're going to give a talk. Uh, is that confirmed now, next, next yeah. week? They're confirmed? Um, I'm guessing it's their HR person who's coming? Or? They're head of recruiting. Yeah. Lead software developer. Lead software developer and head of recruiting. So that's pretty pretty sweet. Uh, yeah, very, very cool company. Uh, definitely, definitely check them out uh, if you get the chance. Spread the word. And then other than that, uh, it, it is a project night. So yeah, you guys can start to talk a little bit more. Obviously, in the lecture mode, you don't have a lot of chance to talk with each other and collaborate on a lot of things. So you know, get mingling. That's that's a really great way to learn. As soon as you have someone else holding you accountable for development, you actually start to pick up things a lot, a lot faster. So it's very cool. Okay, so then after that, it's reading week. Um, and so we will not have class. 
And then after that, regular class will resume back in uh, J106. Is that what is it? Okay, cool. Um, did anybody go to, what is it? Girls Ruby? Oh, Rails, Rails Girls. That's it. Girls Ruby. Uh, you guys went? Cool. Were you part of the organizing team? You, you were, right? I was part of the organizing, but the three of them, they came as participants. Very cool. How'd you like it? It was awesome. Awesome. Cool. I, I, I was totally, I didn't know about it. And then all of a sudden I saw it on Kat's uh, Twitter feed and I was like, wow, this is really cool. This is really sweet. Um, like the fact that that exists is awesome. The fact that you guys went to it is awesome. Uh, I like that the Rails community is building up, which is very cool because it is a very cool framework if you haven't gathered from all my praising. Okay, so I'm assuming this is running and recording. <laughs> um, and just another note, I did split up the lectures a little bit. So um, if you have your old links, I did split up this slide, uh, these slides into three different parts. Um, so just make sure you're looking at the right one when we get to that. OK? OK, so let's get started. Um, so last week, um, what we did is we started to talk about a RESTful resource. Um, so I gave a kind of brief introduction about what, what a RESTful resource was. But I said it's not super important that you understand the full theoretical implications of what a RESTful resource is. Um, and the reason I say that is because I myself don't understand the full implications of what a RESTful resource is. I know kind of some of the things I can talk about, being stateless, uh, the fact that it stands for represent, representational state transfer, um, the fact that you have to identify you know, things with a unique uh, identifier, things like that. But ultimately, I don't really know that much more about it. I've tried to read uh, things about it, um, and I've been confused like crazy. Um, but what I do understand is how the web has implemented it. Okay, so REST uh, REST has a bunch of principles and a bunch of protocols and a bunch of rules, and the web world has implemented those principles using HTTP protocol. Okay, so they've done things like to identify a resource, you use a URL. That's a unique identifier that you can use to identify any resource. To update a resource, you use a HTTP request. If you want to get a resource, you use HTTP request, and this is what we're building over the next couple of weeks. OK? But what we did, what we talked about last week is that in order to do that, we are going to basically adopt this, this diagram here, OK? Um, what we're going to do is we are basically going to build a request and response for each one of the CRUD actions, OK? So to create, to read, to update, and destroy, OK? So we already talked about how to build a request and response to get a certain page, right? We did about, we did home, we did contact, OK? Now we're going to kind of use a similar framework to do actions on a resource. Okay, so all that, remember we did that song and dance about standing up and saying, you know, request, server side processing, response? Okay, something along those lines. Um, that is what we're doing here. And the server side processing that we're going to be doing is acting on this model. Okay, saving the data, reading the data. Updating the data, things like that. That's what we're going to be doing on server side, um, the server side uh, processing. Okay? <laughs> now, this is really where the line is kind of drawn between a website and a web application. Okay, way back in the beginning, I talked about you. You might not know the difference between a website and a web application, but now you should. Okay, the idea is that websites are generally kind of hard coded presentational. Um, maybe a little bit of dynamic JavaScript and UI, but they're generally static information, okay? You're presenting information about a restaurant. Here's the restaurant, here are the store hours, you know, here, uh, here are the store hours, here is the contact information, uh, you know, here's a Google map of where we're located. That's kind of like a website, okay? A web application is more when you have this powerful backend, okay, that uses some kind of server-side code like Ruby or Java or c or whatever, that generally also interacts with the database or some kind of file storage or some kind of data storage, okay? Uh, very typically, it is a database, um, but it could be anything, okay? And then you can start to realize that really, web applications are no different than desktop applications, except that their UI is HTML, is, is web, is seen through the browser. When you think about coding a desktop application in Java or whatever, right, you may use like swing components, right? Uh, but you're still gonna build like a layer that handles the events of the swing components, and when you click on a button, when you have something in the text field, and then you're going to build a layer that probably writes to the database, or writes to a file, or writes to XML, whatever you're going to build, you're going to store that information, right? Um, some of you might have not have gone to that yet, but you will be getting to that. Well, web applications are very similar, 
Except you're not using Swim components, you're using the web. In other words, you're using HTML, using CSS, you're using JavaScript and all that stuff. And the really cool part about that is that web is one of the most powerful UI building tools, okay? HTML, JavaScript, CSS, all that, you can do some really, really fancy stuff. And you combine that powerful UI stuff with the powerful backend of Java, Ruby, or C Sharp, or PHP, you have a really, really cool, powerful application. Okay, there are a lot of reasons why you might, might want to build a, uh, a web application. Uh, one is, again, the powerful tools that you have to build a wicked UI. Two, deployment becomes super easy, right? You're no longer installing Java code on people's machines. You just have a browser running on everybody's machines. I mean, you probably notice more and more when you go to retailers that use software, okay? I was at, I was at the car dealership the other day, and they were, they were uh, you know, fixing my car, and I noticed that their, their application to manage car appointments was a web application. They just open up a browser, navigate to a site, and they start doing all that stuff, right? So again, once Web 2.0 was figured out that you could have the server-side processing, we started realizing that web became a viable platform for building very powerful applications, just as powerful as Java, like straight-up desktop applications, okay? So this is what we're building. So last week, we built the model, <coughs> okay? And the model consisted of two pieces, okay? Who here remembers what those two pieces are? They might be on the screen. What, what would be this here? It might even say it right there. It's the model class. It's like the model class, right? So we're building a new school, so we built a model class. I know, I hate when teachers ask those questions, because you're like, isn't that obvious? It's like, who here remembers what one plus one is? And I'm like, is it really two? You can't be asking a question that easy. <laughs> and a lot of times, too, the questions are really kind of ambiguous, because like, it's really clear in the teacher's mind. But anyways, there's the model class, right? the actual class that we use to instantiate objects. right? Again, how many people here have built a Java class before? OK, good. A lot of you guys have built a Java class. Okay? And then remember, Java classes are like a blueprint. right? You probably have answered that in 12 interviews. What is that class? Right? It's like a blueprint to instantiate objects, right? So that's the first piece, okay, of, of uh, the models that we built, is this model class, okay? So we built a news post class. We can instantiate a news post. We can, uh, you know, have attributes on the news post. We can have methods on the news post and all that stuff, okay? And what was the second piece to our models? Take a guess. It has to do with this piece here. Database, good. It's, it's the database table, okay? Now, now I did have, I, I did slip in a little caveat there. Not all models have a database table associated with it. Okay, that's not necessarily true. But the models that we're building for our intents and purposes do have a database component, okay? Because this is stuff that we are going to save. So any model that you want to save persistently, okay, you're going to have a database component. Okay, so for our models, we always have two pieces: the Ruby class and the database table, okay? So we learned about a generator last week. We used Rails G model, okay? But the model didn't, when we ran that generator, it didn't actually give us a database table, right? What did it give us? It gave us a database script, okay? And so what that meant is it was a, it was a piece of code that would create a database table for us, okay? So, what happens when we want Rails generate model news post, it would generate two main files for us. One was the model class, and the second was a script that we could run to update our database. Okay? It didn't directly update our database for us. Okay? And the reason that is, is so we can keep everybody in sync with each other. I had a good question last week that said, well, why don't we just update the database by itself? And that's true. There's nothing technologically blocking you from doing that. If you guys know SQL statements and you want to update the database yourself, you can do that. But it's a bad practice because then you have to tell all your other coders that, hey, I added this column to this database. Make sure you guys update your columns. What happens if you go deploy this on a customer site and then we run all these migrations to update the tables and then we're like, oh wait, we forgot to add that column. It was that email, you know, that was sent this back and forth, right? It gets kind of hairy that way. And that's the way we used to code all the time, right? We used to email each other back and forth and say, guys, update your database table because I added this column, or whatever, or, or I, I email you this script or whatever, right? So emailing script is actually a step forward because you have the script. So if you know if I was working on something, I email it to Ryan. Ryan can run that script. That is a step forward. But an extra step above that would be sweet is if 
I can put all those scripts in my source code. So that all Ryan has to do is update his source code, you know, pull it down from Git or SVN or whatever, and he has that script. And it'd be sweet if we had a command to run all our scripts. And that's what we did last week. So last week, we ran the generator to generate the model and a, and a database script. And then we learned one more command to actually run that database script so it would actually create the table for us. Okay, that's what a model is, okay, in a nutshell. All right, million dollar question. Does anybody remember what the command was to run, to, to run the database script? You want to yell at him? Yep. Rake db migrate. Okay, rake is a command uh, that's included in Ruby that allows you to basically write script. Uh, write. It's kind of weird. You're writing scripts that run scripts. Okay, so db migrate is a script that you can run that runs the database script to update your database table. Okay. So this is all in those notes if you've forgotten. But the main take home from last week is that that one generator, that Rails G model, will generate the class for you and generate the Script to update your database table. Okay. Who here again has taken a database course? Who here, even if you haven't taken a database course, who here has uh, any knowledge of SQL databases? Okay. So, yeah, any knowledge at all. If you know of them, that's pretty good. Okay. Uh, so, the thing about SQL databases, again, is that they're effectively Excel spreadsheets. Okay. That's how, if, if everyone's used Excel before, or seen what Excel is, or done a table in Microsoft Word. Yeah, that's essentially what they are, okay? It's just tables of data, okay? It's a way to store, like you think about if you have a class list, or you may have first name, last name, and so on and so forth, okay? That's what a database is, it's just a, a table of data, all right? So um, what we basically do with SQL is there's a language to interact with that data, how to insert rows into that data, how to extract rows from that data. And it's a very smart language. You can do things like, you know, Give me all the students that have a mark above 70%, you know? Uh, give me all the students who were absent last week or whatever. Give me all the students whose names start with C, all that kind of stuff, okay? That's the SQL language, okay? We are not gonna go over that in this class, but know that that's what's back, that's what's powering your database, okay? Ruby code will eventually work with a SQL statement to do that stuff, okay? Now, for those of you who are, um, you know, pretty familiar with SQL, I will mention one thing, that SQLite, which is the database vendor that we're using, okay, there's Microsoft SQL Server, there's SQLite, there's Postgres, there's MySQL. Um, SQLite is pretty sweet because it doesn't actually require a server. It doesn't actually require something running on your system. It all is just a file, basically, okay? Um, but to interact with that file, you need another piece of software. Okay, Ruby on Rails, when you generate a new application, it already has that software built in. But if you yourself want to view that data, and you want to run SQL statements and stuff like that, you can download something like SQLite Browser, okay? Has anybody here ever used uh, Microsoft SQL Management Studio? Okay, has anybody used, um, who, who here has used Microsoft SQL Server? Okay, how many people have used MySQL? Okay, for those of you guys who use MySQL, have you ever run like a select statement or yeah, an insert statement? That's basically what you can do with this. Okay, you can use that to run that information. I'll show you really quickly what it looks like. Um, so basically, what it what you do is you have this program and you can open your data file. So our data file actually sits in our source code folder. Usually, does not get checked in the source code, but it's in that folder. Okay, so we're using the development database. And then you can execute SQL in here, just like any other, um, just like any other, uh, you know, SQL uh, database vendor. Okay, select star, you can get your your rows back. You can do inserts and all that jazz. Okay. Okay, we're still kind of reviewing from last uh, last week here. Some new information. Okay, if you guys open up your uh, project file. Still touching on the model here. Um, so under the DB folder, again, this is where your data exists, okay? You can't really view it, okay? Because this is basically a data file. I don't know if it's encrypted or binary or whatever. Um, but basically, this is data that we can't access, we can't see in plain text. But when you uh, insert records, when you delete records, all the stuff like that, it gets written to this file, basically, okay? Now, I should mention that every Ruby on Rails application, by default, has three databases that it can connect to. 
Okay. Why might you want to connect to more than one database? Yeah. For testing development production or something? <laughs> yeah, or something. Somebody's done their career on Rails development. That's exactly right. For testing development production or something. Um, you can basically picture that this is data, okay? So when you have a, say, let's say you had a database of class, class names, right? Um, you know, you had, you had your, all your student names <laughs> loaded into the database, um, and you're developing this data over time. You may want a different database for your testing or for your development than you want for your actual live data, right? Because you may be like, you want to just insert like 100 rows just to check, see if, if it's actually displaying 100 rows, stuff like that. You might not actually want to load these dummy entries into your production database, right? And that's, what, that's why Ruby on Rails by default has noticed that they said, you know what? Generally, you would have three different databases that you connect to, where the data is completely separate, OK? And that's what Ruby on Rails adopted. So I'm going to introduce a new file to you guys. It's in the config directory. It's called database.yaml. Okay, YAML is another language, yet again, that you guys are going to learn. Okay, um, basically what this says is these are the connection settings for your uh, three different databases. Okay, for development, for test, and production. And what this basically says is the development database is going to be in the db folder. It's going to be called development.sqlite3. Your test one is going to be in the db folder called test.sqlite3. Production is going to be in the db folder production.sqlite3. Okay, for those of you who are used to MySQL or Postgres and stuff like that, you're probably used to connection strings, right? Your server, your port, things like that. This is where you would specify. Okay, you would specify your MySQL host, your port, uh, your username, your password, all that, all, all the connection string information to connect to that database. That's how you would do it. Okay, so by default, when we created this Ruby on Rails uh, app, it said, you know, we're just going to use the default settings, which is we're going to use a, a SQLite which just has a file system. Okay, that's where all your information is stored. When you actually run in test mode or production mode, which we haven't gotten to, those new files will be created. Okay, so right now development was created, and that's why that exists there. Okay, that's all about storing information. I remember uh, for the longest time when I was in software engineering, I hated the applications we were developing because nothing was stored. Okay, every application I knew that I interact with, it, it wouldn't like lose my like I when I wrote a Microsoft Word essay. It's not like when I shut down my computer and wake up the next day, I'd have to retype the whole thing, right? Every application I could think of would save the data that I was using, right? So it was a really big deal when I got to databases where you, your information was actually stored somewhere, okay? Or the first time I did file writing, I was like, thank God, my information is actually, my application is actually useful, right? Same deal here, okay? All right, any questions about the model? Okay, I know I, I repeat myself a lot, but it's just to drive things home. It is a model class and a script to create a database table. And then you can run rake db migrate to actually run the script to create the table in your database. OK? All right, no questions? Cool. All right, so what we did last week is we basically coded this lower piece. We created that model, and we played around with it. OK? Today, we're going to play a little bit more around with this. Okay. We're going to play around with the model, see what methods it has to offer us. We kind of touched on it in the last five minutes, the last thoughts. And then we're going to start building these requests and responses one by one. And we're going to use the same pattern for all of them. We're going to create a route, we're going to create an action, and we're going to create a response. Okay, we're going to do it six times, actually. There's only four there, but we'll get into why there's, there's two others. Okay, that's where we're going. Let's play around with the model. The really cool thing about the model and the really cool thing about Ruby on Rails um, is it is a minimalist language, and the sense is if you follow their conventions, you code less. You code nothing, okay? If you follow the conventions, you code nothing. If you use their generators, it automatically uses their conventions. Okay, so we created a model called NewsPost. So because we use the generator, okay, it automatically used Ruby on Rails conventions. So what it did for us is it created this NewsPost uh, class. And it called it singular, uh, capital camel case. Okay, and the script that it created, db migrate here, is it created a table called a table called news posts plural. This is following the Ruby on Rails convention, 
And so if you do that, these two will automatically be hooked up. When you create a news post and you save it, it automatically knows to save it to the news posts table. No configuration required. Okay. Normally, in any other language or framework, you'd have to do something like this. Database table is called news posts. And it's true if you don't follow the convention. Let's say you really hate Ruby on Rails convention and you want to use a different table name. You can, as long as you specify the database table name. It's not exactly like that, but it's code similar to that. Okay. But I always follow the convention so I don't have to type. Okay, the less I have to type, the better. All right? That's what's called convention over configuration. We'll see a lot of examples of that. Convention over configuration. We actually saw it when we did the controller action, remember? Def home, render home. We didn't have to type in render home because the convention is if you name your template the same as your action, it just automatically goes. Okay, so let's play around with this news post. Last week I said the coolest thing about this is because of active record, because we're extending this, we got a lot of methods for free. Dylan, you asked a really good question last week uh, about how it actually dynamically creates these methods or something along those lines. Like we were in the Rails console and we were um, you know, calling things like newspost.title, newspost.author, sending them, getting them. And I gave you some stupid answer about how it uh, uses this missing method. First of all, it's not called missing method. Or wait, it's exactly called missing method. I called it no method last week. Okay. I gave you this, this, this BS answer about missing method. That is the case for a lot of methods, but not for, the, not for the getters and setters. The getters and setters are actually dynamically programmed in when the class is loaded. So what happens is when you load up a Ruby on Rails environment or you run the Rails server, this class gets loaded. And one of the first things it does is it dynamically programs itself to have those getters and setters. Okay? I tried to go through the code millions of times. It's pretty complex code. But Ruby on Rails has a lot of metaprogramming, which means programs that can program themselves. You can dynamically add class methods, you can dynamically add instance methods, dynamically add variables, all this stuff. Okay, and that's what Ruby on Rails leverages a lot. Like while you're mid coding, while your program's running, you can actually program a class to have extra methods and extra variables and all this stuff. And that's what they do with this, okay? Active record, one of the things they do is they set up your getters and setters for all your database columns, okay? And if the database table is uploaded, or sorry, updated, as long as the class is reloaded, so if you restart your server um, in development mode, if you just refresh the page, okay, the class is reloaded, then it dynamically adds those getters and setters. Okay. If you don't remember any of that, let's let's deal with it right now. Okay. So uh, if you launch up your console um, or your terminal, you go to your dev folder, you go to your Rails projects, you go to your test app. Okay, we talked about something last week called the Rails console. This is one of the really cool things to play around with. And okay, what this allows you to do is play around with your Ruby on Rails code. IRB allows you to play with Ruby code. Ruby on Rails, uh, sorry, Rails console allows you to play with IR, or Ruby code and your Ruby on Rails classes that you code. Okay, now here's something to know about this I didn't tell you last week. Everything you do in here by default is affecting the development database. Okay, so when you run your Rails server, that's gonna affect the development database. If you run Rails console, it's gonna affect that same database. So if you were to add entries in here, you would also see them in your web app if you coded it to look up those entries. Okay, so this is all affecting the same database. Okay, Rails console, Rails server. It's not until you explicitly say run in production mode that you will be affected in the production database. Okay, so everything we're doing is in the development database. Okay, so last week, we said we could start playing around with this with this news post, okay? So again, if you were to type in something like news post, that's a variable name, right, lowercase, and we want to instantiate a news post, in Java, we would do something like new, like we would do something like this, right? New news post, like call the constructor, right? In fact, we'd probably go a little bit further than, than this in Java. In Java, it'd probably be something like this, right? You have a variable of type news post, equals new constructor of the news post, right? Ruby it doesn't have strongly typed variables, so you don't need that. It doesn't even have declaration of variables, so you don't even need a var news post or whatever. The very first time you use it, that's when it's declared. And then the keyword for the constructor um, of any, of any uh, class is like this, dot new. It's just like a method on, on the class itself. It's a class method. Okay, that will instantiate your news post. So now in memory, you have a news post. And it has all the getters and setters that we, uh, 
that we established, okay? Title and body were really the only two that we created when we created in our generator. And then I talked about how ID created that and updated that were automatic because that's a good practice in programming. To always have an ID of all your objects uh, and created that and updated that are probably less important, but they are they come in handy a lot. Okay, there are ways to override that, by the way, if you really hate that updated that and created that there. Um, but again, I don't know why you have such a strong hatred for non when your records are updated or created. That. So that's what taking up too much memory. Okay, so then we have a new supposed sitting there in memory. That's like calling the constructor on a Java object. And then in Java, we probably have getters and setters, right? We'd have set title, get title. Uh, maybe not even that. We just have title equals or you know, these operator overrides for those who know, so know what that are, those are. Okay? So we have this news post object. Okay, and we can start doing things with it. We can set its title. Okay. Just like that. We get that for free. Okay, that's one of the accessors that got dynamically programmed into it when we loaded this class. Um, so we can say, uh, you know, Ruby on Rails class move this week. Okay, we can set the body we want. Uh, so what do we want? Uh, move to zero one three one. That's how we can use the setters. We can also use its getters to like put them into a string or something, right? Let's say we want to concatenate a string. So uh, you know, news today plus news post dot title okay maybe we want a space in there okay. maybe some of you guys will remember string interpolation when we did a little bit of that in the getting to know ruby so you could have done that a little bit differently you could have been like news today and then you could use this and that's how you're getting and you and using that information now it, it's it's a string like any other string, so you could also do anything. You can do method chaining, right? You can do things like dot size, you know, thirty six characters. You can do things like dot reverse if you want. Okay. You can do you can do a lot of things with that, right? Anything that a string will do, because though that's basically a string on that. Okay. Um, now it also includes a lot of database methods. Okay, uh, it was Dylan, right? Dylan talked, uh, he walked us through what his algorithm would have been to create a database level class. And in that class, there was probably a method like save or a method like load. Okay, and the idea of save was to take all the information that was encapsulated in this instance and save it to the database. Okay, so the idea is that you would take, you know, the title and the body and if there was an ID or whatever, this and that, and write a SQL statement that would save it to the database. Okay, and we'd abstract that with a method we call it .save. Okay, we get that for free as well. Okay, so here if you call newspost.save, that actually writes it to the database. And you can actually see, uh, you actually can get an idea of how it did that. The way it did that is by creating this SQL statement here. Insert into the newspost table all these values. Okay, so we get these database operations for free as well. Okay. So that's how you would save. Now, what if you want to extract information out of the database? You maybe want to retrieve that, that news post. Or maybe you want to retrieve the news post that we created last week. There was a, we created a news post last week. Okay. Or maybe you want to uh, you know, retrieve it by ID or whatever, this and that. Right? Um, so you can do that as well. And this is, these are some new things that I didn't go over last week. Okay? So there's a way you can grab every news post back if you want. Okay? So you can say news posts. Now that, that's a new variable, right? Because we haven't typed that before. And we can call news post dot all. Okay, now these are not something, these aren't things that you can logic out. This is just stuff you get used to the more you use active record. Okay. You can Google active record methods and you'll see these these methods. There's all, there's find by, there's find on so on and so forth. Okay, so now news post dot all is assigned to the news post uh, variable, that's basically an array of news posts. Okay, so I can grab the first news post from that if I want. I can grab the second news post from that if I want. Okay, I can grab the first news post title. Do all this basic object-oriented programming at that point. Okay. 
but a really keen, you can look at what an active relation is. If you notice, newspost.all didn't technically return an array. It ever returned an active record relation. It's some pretty cool, crazy, only load when you need to uh, stuff. But effectively, it's an array of stuff. Okay. Um, you can also do finds, individual finds. Okay, so you want to load all the news posts, but maybe you want to you want to load just one news post. Okay, there's a bunch of ways you can do that. So I'm going to override the news post that I already have in there. You can do a find by ID. Okay, straight up just find. Okay, is by ID. Now IDs are sequential, by the way. So when you save the first news post, it was one, two, three, four, so on and so forth. Okay. So let's say I want to find the news post with ID one. There, it's returned. On news post is ID two, it's returned. Okay. Let's say I want to find by um, certain characteristics. Okay. So like, let's say I want to find where the title is Ruby on Rails class moves. Let's say a hundred, hundred, you know, entries in here, and I want to find. Let's let's create a new one actually. Let's say news post equals news post dot new. News post dot title will say is Casey boring article. Um, then the article just got amazing. Save that. Okay, now we have three records in the database. Okay, sitting in the database. Now let's say I want to find now let's say I want to find that specific news post. I can do things like this. Find by okay and then you can pass in a hash. And again, if you don't know what a hash is, please go to the Getting to Know Ruby video. That was one of the few successful Google Hangout recordings. Um, it'll show you what that's all about. Okay, but a hash is a very important uh, data structure in Ruby on Rails. I use it all over the place. Again, I never used hashes anywhere else. Uh, uh, .NET programmers might know this as a dictionary, but they're basically key value pairs. Okay, so you can pass in a key value pair. You can say where the title is Casey. Okay, and that will return that. Again, because Ruby is a minimalist language, little little side tip here. If the last argument in any method is a hash, okay, you actually don't have to specify the braces on it. Okay, I could have easily written this exactly like this as well. Okay, find by takes in a hash. It, it's actually the only argument it takes in that case. Okay, but you could have like four arguments, and if the last argument of that method's a hash, you can actually leave off the braces. Okay. We'll actually use a lot of that when we get into a lot more fancy ERP. Okay, so you can you can see how you can extract news posts. You can save news posts. Lastly, how do we destroy a news post? Um, so I have this news post in memory right now. This is the Casey one. So if I do news post dot destroy, that deletes it. Okay. So you might have SQL delete from news post where, and it does it by ID. Okay. So all these free methods, it's amazing. You don't have to code a database layer at all, basically. OK? Any questions about Active Record? Cool. There's a lot of other functions in there um, that we'll get into. There's a lot of other really cool functions you can perform on arrays and all this stuff like that. Um, but we'll get into that as we program. OK? So now, remember what I said. Everything we just did there affected the de development database. OK? So if I actually go back into my SQLite browser, and I open up my development database. Okay, I should see the two records in there, right? We had three, but then I destroyed one, right? Okay, and there are the two records. Okay, this one was created today, February 2nd. This one created last week. Okay. And by the way, if you happen to do stuff here, I mean, it's the same database. So if you went back into your Rails console and tried to do a find, you, you'd be affecting that as well. Okay. So it's the same database. Um, have, has anybody here ever studied primary keys or foreign keys? OK. Just for you guys, um, just as a general rule of thumb, Ruby on Rails treats the database as a dumb database. Um, so all foreign key management, dependencies, and all that stuff like that is generally not handled at the database level in a Ruby on Rails application. It can be, but it's not the convention. The convention is basically that Ruby on Rails will handle that those relationships for you. So that if this record is destroyed, that this has to be intact or whatever, 
that's actually handled at the model code level, not down at the database level. Okay. Okay. Any questions on the model? Okay. All that code that we just played around with, that is what we're going to be using in our server side processing. Okay. When we need to destroy a news post, we will use that code. When we need to create a new news post, we will use that code. When we need to update one, we'll use that code as well. I didn't show you the update code, but we'll get into that. Okay. So I, I just want to show you some of the capabilities of what the model has just by extending Active Record, and we'll use that code in our server side processing. Okay. So what we are going to do again is we are going to build this diagram here. We are going to build this diagram right here. Now, again, what we did here was we already coded the model. We already, we already have the database to start with information. So now what we have to do is we have to create a request from the website that allows us to create, read, update, and destroy the database, or the, database, the records in the database. Okay? Now, to do that, there are actually six request response cycles we're going to go through. Okay. Um, two of them, is it six? Recreate the next show. It might be seven. We'll see how many it is. But they all, they all fit into these categories. Okay. For example, read, we actually have two ways to read it. We either want to read an individual news post, or we want to see an index of all the news posts. Okay, those are both read actions, right? Uh, you may want to have a page that shows all your news posts. You may want to have a page that shows your individual news posts. You can liken this to Facebook users. You may have a page where an administrator can see all the Facebook users, and a page where they can click on it and then see the individual Facebook users. More details about that, okay? So that read option will be split into two, actually. Create and update will actually be split into two as well. Okay? Creating is kind of a two-step process. The first process, the first part of the process is to present a user a form to fill out. If you're going to create a news post, present the user with a way to type in the title and type in the body. Okay? And the second request, when they submit it, will be to actually create that news post. Okay? So the first half of it is to present them the form. Second half of it is to actually create it. Same thing's going to happen with updates. Update will be Present them the form, and then actually do the update. Okay, so if my count is right, that's seven. Okay, so create has two, read has two, update has two, and destroy has one. Okay, we're going to go through seven actions here. Okay, hopefully we'll get through one of them today. And again, it's the same process over and over again. Think about it: request, server-side processing, response. Okay, request, server-side processing, response. Okay, it's the basis of all Web 2.0 languages. OK, so a request starts with a request that comes from the browser, and then it hits what file in the Ruby on Rails framework. It's the very first thing that a request hits in the Ruby on Rails framework. Right. Routes. OK. In that diagram, the very first file it hits is routes. OK, then the routes does what? Directs it to a controller. A controller and a action. Okay. So hits the routes, routes directs it to a controller and action. Now remember, an action is just a method in the controller. Okay. We just call it an action because it has a special uh, a special meaning in this case. Okay. But it's just a method in that control. Okay. And then up till now, after it goes through any kind of server-side processing in that method, it usually renders what? A view, okay, or it takes a template and renders that into a view, okay. We did this with render home, right? And remember, there's a couple of things it does there. It massages any server side ERB code. It throws it into the layout, right? It packages all that into a HTTP response and sends that back. Okay, the render does all that. But as far as we're concerned, basically you're you're rendering a template, okay. So this is what we're gonna do: hit the routes file, go to a controller action. Render some kind of response, typically a view, and then go from there. 
We're going to do this six, seven times. Okay. And by the way, each time there's some little intrical, like intricacy that makes it a little bit more complicated. Okay. The about page, the contact page, and all that, that was the easy stuff. Now we're getting to a bit more complex stuff. Okay. All right. Now, the way we're going to do this is we are going to follow HTTP REST conventions. Okay, again, technologically, there's nothing saying that you have to do this. But the web world has adopted these conventions, as has Ruby on Rails. Okay, um, remember we talked about GET and POST, re post requests? There's a GET request, there's a POST request. There's also two other ones. There's PUT and there's DELETE. Okay, these are just types of requests that your, your browser can send to a server. And not all browsers support all four of these, by the way. Okay. Almost every browser supports a get and a post. And the way you can view that, again, is they're just different types of requests, OK? Literally, when you see it, look at requests, there'll be like a type, get, type, post, or whatever, OK? And the other two are put and delete, OK? So here's an example convention. The web world says if you ever use a get request, it should never update data, OK? That means you should never create data. It should never update data. It should never destroy data. It should never touch data when you use a get request. Again, technologically, there's nothing stopping you from doing that, OK? But the web world has accepted that this is typically what you would do, is never use a GET request to change any data, OK? So that's an example of a convention that we're going to follow. We're going to be following those conventions for all these types of requests, OK? OK, so the reason I mentioned that is because while we're doing this, you may ask me, well, why did you use a GET request and why did you name it this? This is all part of the web convention. OK, this is all part of the conventions that have been established. Again, technologically, you can code them a different way. But why do that when the whole world expects it to behave a certain way? It'd be like saying, like, if you clicked on a delete button, it added a new record. That's a weird convention to follow. Technologically, you can do that, right? You can code a delete button on your Java app that adds a new record. But that'd be really strange, right? It'd be really strange. Same kind of deal here, OK? All right, so we are going to create a bunch of routes in here. And I'm, I'm just going to, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just comment this section so we know what we're talking about here. And this is for the news post resource. We're going to code a bunch of routes here. Okay. And the ones we're going to code, one called new, there's one called create, there's one called index, one called show, there's one called edit, there's one called update, there's one called destroy. Remember how I said the first action, the create, was split into two, right? Presenting the form and then actually a separate request to create, yeah, uh, to create it, right? That's what new and create are. New is to present them the form. Create actually creates the entry in the database. Okay. Index and show are the two read actions. Index is a listing. Show is an individual record. So if you want a listing of your news posts, or do you want to just show the page for the specific news post? You may have seen this in blogs, right? When you go to a blog, that's an index that shows all the articles. And then when you click on the article, you can usually view all the comments, or if you're an administrator, you can edit that blog post and so on and so forth. That's the show action. Okay. Edit and update are kind of uh, analogous to new and create. Edit is the form that you present to the user, and updates to create the form. And then the last one is destroy, which means you just destroy the record. Those, that's what we're going to be creating. OK, so any questions on what we're going to be creating? All right, let's go through this. We're going to go to the routes, the controller, do some server-side processing, and then, uh, and then create a response. OK? Now, the easiest ones to do are index and show. So that's what we're going to start with. OK? Now, typically, I would not start with index and show because index and show uh, index and show, you're showing records, right? You need some records to, to display on list. And show, you need to show a record that, that is in your database as well, right? But we've been playing around in that database in the Rails console, right? So we actually have two records that are sitting in there, right? We did Rails console and we, we created these things. So we actually have records in our database that we can show and we can index. OK, so I'm going to start with those two first, OK? So let's start with the index. The way this is going to look, OK, is um, can anybody who's not done this <laughs> take a guess as to whether I would use a GET request, a POST request, a PUT request, or a DELETE request? 
if I'm like grabbing information to show. Get, yeah, exactly. Get is the right answer, okay? Because we're not changing any data here. We're just displaying the information, right? So get would be a good choice, and get is what the web world has decided to use for that. So it is going to be a get request, okay? And specifically for news posts, okay, the convention is you are going to have all your resource routes. The URLs are all going to be relative to the resource, okay? So what this is going to look like is this, news posts. So if I send a get request to the news posts URL, something's going to happen here. Okay. Now remember, there are multiple multiple ways to send a get request. What's the easiest way to send a get request from your browser? Input a URL. When you type a URL into your browser address bar and you hit enter, that is sending a get request to that URL. Okay. So your most basic interaction with the internet were, were get requests, OK? Can somebody think of another way you can send a get request? Links. links, perfect. Links is another way to do it. Anytime you have a link on your web page, when you click on that, it's sending a get request to whatever that link is pointing to, OK? That, those are the two most common ways. Good stuff. OK, getting some, getting some uh, class participation, it's good. OK, so get news posts. So this can either be a link to slash news posts, or it can be just typing in a URL to test this out. Okay? Now, we have to point this. We have to point this to a controller. OK? So what controllers do we have right now? We have an application controller, which I never talked about. And we have a pages controller. OK? So. Um, I was going to ask you guys a question, but then it'd be kind of be a trick question, so let's not do that. So, anytime we talk about a RESTful resource, okay, Gabe, what's going on? All my old students are showing up. Um, anytime we talk about a a RESTful resource, okay, we talked about that it has its own table, it has its own model, okay. Well, it also has its own controller, okay. So we don't have a news post controller let yet. So let's create one, OK? Now, there's two ways you can do this. You can use a, a code generator to make sure it's done properly. Or you can code it yourself if you're an expert on it, OK? By the way, same thing could have done, been, been done with the model. You could have hand coded that if you want. Code the model class and code the migration, OK? I don't know migration syntax that well, so that's why I ended up using the generator, OK? Controller code's a little bit easier, but I'll still use a generator just to get you guys in the hang of using a generator, OK? So we don't have a. Uh, a news post controller yet. So let's actually create one. Okay, so I'm just going to open up a new tab here in my terminal. You can either open up a new command prompt window, or you can have a new tab or whatever, whatever it allows you. Or you can stop this Rails console. If you want to stop the Rails console, just type exit. So again, just make sure you are in your test app folder. Everything we do is relative to the app folder. So what you want to do is you want to run Rails generate again. And remember, it's just G for short. Okay, You can type in generate if you want. And we're going to generate a controller. Okay, so get in the habit of using these code generators. Rails G model, blah, 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 blah. Rails G controller, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So in this case, it's going to be the news post controller. Another convention to memorize. Models of singular. Tables plural. Controller is plural. Okay, So we're going to do a news posts controller. And by the way, this for sure has stumped me and a lot of other Rails developers and a lot of students in my class, OK? Is that if you don't get these conventions right, things may blow up, OK? Not literally, obviously. Your computer's not going to be set on fire. If you don't really know the term literally well, watch my YouTube video on literally. Uh, but what's going to happen is that things aren't going to be hooked up properly because you're not following the conventions anymore. OK, remember the news, the news post model hooked up to the news post table? OK, if you name them differently, how's Rails supposed to know how they're going to hook up? Same thing with the controllers, OK? OK, so it's a, it's a plural, so news posts controller. And that's all you have to do, OK? There's a lot of other stuff you can type here as a shortcut, but we're not going to get into that. We're going to hand code the rest of this, OK? And you'll see it, it actually doesn't do that much. Whoa, things exploded. 
What happened there? Default controller, missing action key on routes definition. Rails generate controller, news posts. Huh. That is strange. That is definitely the code. I don't know why that's failing. OK. I don't know why. That's, I think was, my RVM wasn't uh, doing its job there. OK. So what did it create? Again, outside the scope of this class, it created a bunch of test classes. OK. You got the same thing? Yeah. Are you using RVM? Yeah. Try to do CD space dot and try it again. Oh, I just literally up into the network. OK. Sweet. <laughs> Weird things are afoot at site 0131. OK, so it created a bunch of test folders, created some helper classes, created assets, which is a very cool topic in Ring on Rails. But really, the only thing we're concerned about right now is that it created the controller, the very top line. Okay, it created something in app controllers, news post controller. OK, let's go look at that file. When we look at that file, OK, this is what we see. Typical Ruby on Rails style, it's very empty. Okay, but it's extending the application controller, which gives us all that hook in to routes and rendering and all that jazz. Okay. So now we have a controller. Now we're ready to map our routes to our controller. Okay. I'm gonna give you a guys give you guys a little hint. Okay. All these comments here are our actions. Okay, we're going to have a new action, a create action, index action, show action, edit action, update action, destroy action. Okay, that's why comments are done that way. Okay, that's why I didn't call it list. Okay, index is essentially a listing. I could call it listing if I wanted to. Right, but these are the, the web conventions and the Ruby on Rails conventions. Okay, so we are dealing with this here. So we are going to forward this to the news post controller the index action of that controller, OK? I'll give you guys a few minutes to guess as to what the syntax of that is. And then I'll slowly type it. Controller action, OK? Again, if you're using Sublime, if you're using double quotations, chances are when you hit the hashtag, it did the Curly braces for string interpolation, just backspace out of that. It's one of the rare cases where you use um, the hashtag just like that, okay? Inside a string. Controller action. Okay, so if I were to type in slash news post relative to my host in my browser, it would forward me to the news post index, uh, news post index action, okay? So that would forward me to here. So now I need an index action, OK? So remember, actions are just methods in the controller. So when I type in news post in the browser, it sends me to this method, where we are going to do server-side processing and then prepare your response. Prepare the response. A rep response. Okay. Now, server side processing, a lot of the times, especially when it comes to restful resources, is dealing with the database. Okay. What do we want? Like, what do we want to, how do we want to interact with the database in this case? What, what are we trying to do here? We want to display all the news posts. Okay, index is a listing of all instances of that resource. So when we're in the news post index, we want to show all the news posts. Okay, so we want to grab all the news posts. Okay, so what we can do, we can do something like this. You guys just learned that today. You can grab all the news posts and assign that. Like that will return an array. You can assign that into the news posts variable. Okay. And then I, in this case, I actually want to show a page, right? I want to show a page with all the news posts. So I actually want to render a template. I want to render a view. Okay, so I want to render, um, you know, the news posts index.
Good question. Can you do you need to specify news posts or can you just specify index? Why do you ask that? Yes. So that's exactly it. I've I've gone over this a couple times, if you guys have been in the last couple classes, that the render already knows to look. If you are rendering a template, okay, within that controller, it already knows to look in that folder, okay, if they're named the same. Okay. So rather than us putting it somewhere else at random, why don't we put it in that folder and then we don't have to type it here? Okay? Good point. So we don't actually need this as long as we put our template inside a new sports folder in the name the same way. Another convention over configuration. Okay? So you don't actually have to configure it to where to look. It's just by convention, it'll know how to do it. Okay? And maybe slightly obvious question, can we refactor this anymore? Can we remove any more code? Does Ruby know to render the index because it's the method for the actions index? Exactly. Ruby knows to look in the news post folder and for a template that's named the same as its action. So we don't actually need this either. Okay. Again, the more you do this, the more you program Ruby, the more you'll hate every other language. <laughs> You're like, why do I have to type so much? Honestly, like the amount of requests I get from my clients that are over five minutes is a staggeringly low percentage. Like every like 95% of the requests I get from my clients are are like all under five minutes because Ruby on Rails is like, yeah, I'll just make that change, done, submit, push, done. Right? It's it's really that easy. Okay. So we don't actually need to tell what to render. Okay. So let's create a index page. OK, so we do need to code this, unfortunately. Uh, OK, so in the views, we need to add a new folder. Um, now, again, I have a plugin that allows me to do this directly in Sublime. You guys might have to do this in your Windows Explorer or your, or your Finder. OK, but basically, you want to add a new folder underneath views. You, can't, you guys can't do that directly in Sublime, can you? Oh, OK, that is something you can do. OK, sweet. So create a new folder, and we're going to call it news posts. Oops. What did I do? New folder, news posts. Oh, I already created it. How did I create that? Was it created already for you guys? OK. When we created the controller, it automatically created it for us. When we did that Rails generate, uh, thing it actually already created the folder for us because it knew that we were probably going to do it anyways. Again, it gets annoying when you actually have to code now. Uh, okay, so we got the folder and now we just have to create the template, right? So let's right click, create a new file in there. Um, and then the new file is going to be index.html.erb. That I can't, can you guys do that? Yes, right click or file new and then save. Yeah. Okay. So just basically file new and then save as, make sure that's in the news post folder. I'm sorry I can't make this bigger, guys. Like, I don't know how to magnify this. OK, but basically app views news posts and then index.html.erb. Now, let's just throw some HTML in here to make sure we are getting that routing properly, OK? The route to the controller action, to the template, and back out. Okay, let's, let's not put any complex logic in there. Let's just get some HTML in there. See what we're dealing with. Okay, so let's put in a header, and let's uh, say news posts. Okay, and then we say uh, you know welcome to the news posts page. Okay, just some HTML in there. Nothing crazy yet. Okay, so very similar to what we did with about contact and um, a, a, what's it called home. Home button contact, right? Nothing really different there. We created a route, created a controller action. We happen to do some server-side processing in this one, uh, and, but the the, uh, the output is not really that different. We just threw out some HTML in there, right? Okay, so let's uh, see what this looks like. We have to start up our Rails server. So back in your console, make sure you run your Rails server. Okay, once it's started, you'll see uh, you know. Listening on port 3000, Webbrick has started. You should be able to go to localhost 3000 slash news posts. 
day. Now, all of you should also have a red gradient on your screen. So if you don't have that, we'll, we'll talk after <laughs> class. This will make no sense for the Google Hangout recording. <laughs> you know, all the, all the three people that watch it. Uh, OK, so news post, it worked. That's great. We got the request going. Uh, it, it probably did a database request. We're not sure because we have no evidence of it here. And then it rendered this thing back out. Okay. By the way, if you kept in render news post index, it, it's fine. That's that's okay too. It, it's just you don't have to put it in. Okay. It's kind of the nice thing about Ruby on Rails. It does do convention over configuration, but if you want to break convention, it allows you to do that do that as well. Okay. There we go. That's that's a really good step forward. Okay. So now. This is kind of useless. This is not displaying our news posts. Let's actually use those news posts in our template using ERB. OK? Again, if you don't know what that is, I think that one might have been recorded successfully as well. I don't know. Uh, there are notes on it, though, though, as well. OK? How to use ERB in here. OK, so who knows? If I want to use news posts from the controller action, and I want to use that in my template, what do I have to change here? You have to put an at. Okay? That makes it an instance variable. Remember, instance variables are no different than any, uh, any other instance variables for the object-oriented programmers, except in controllers. In controllers, they have a very special behavior in the sense that now they're shared between the controller and the view. Okay? Really, what's going on in the background, though, is that render method. Remember that render method does a massaging and stuff like that? Well, it's just using that instance variable in that render method to do all of, all of its jobs. Right? So, but really, the way we can see is that they're two separate files. How do we share between them? We have to make it an instance variable. Okay, And that's how you make an instance variable. Okay, Remember, in Java, you'd probably do something like this. You know, you'd have like array, news posts, you know, and then you would use that news post down here. In this case, all you have to do is put an at sign in front of it. Now it's an instance variable. By the way, we don't really need any of this other stuff. This, this is how small your method is. By the way, if your methods get any bigger than four or five lines in Ruby, or in any programming language, language for that matter, it, it's a general rule of thumb that your like, method is getting too big. Okay? Start separating, separating into smaller methods to smaller methods. Okay? What is it, one purpose method or a single purpose method or something? Some software principle. OK, so I haven't changed anything except I made an instance variable. Now that it's an instance variable, I can now reference that in my template, OK? In the server-side tags, though. Remember, HTML doesn't understand this Ruby code. OK, it's got to be within server-side tags to make this work, OK? So let's just do a little test here. Let's create another paragraph here. And let's say number of posts. OK, and then we're going to do, have server side tags here. OK, so it's less than percent. And then you close it with percent greater than. If you want the result to be actually inserted into the HTML, you have to put an equal sign. If you don't want the result to be inserted to the HTML, you just want to do some pro processing, then you leave the equal sign out. OK, typically what it is is you leave the equal sign out when you use control structures, like if statements, loops, stuff like that. You leave the equal sign out in general. Okay. Um, when you're displaying data, though, you want that data to actually be put in the HTML, so you put an equal sign there. Okay, and so let's just put the size of this thing here. Okay, news post dot size. It's similar to what does Java use? Array dot length. Um, oh, you size and length. Okay, sweet. Okay, there we go. So that number should be two, right? Because we had two posts in our database, right? So let's see what happens. Boom. We're doing well. We actually queried the database, got some records back, and checked the size of that data, and displayed it here. OK? This is like, I know <laughs> this is like programming when your output is command line output. It was like, oh, yay, great. I worked 30 hours, and there's a line that says the answer is 36. Same kind of deal. But this is pretty crazy what's going on here. Okay? You, you guys are actually doing a request that's going across. This could be going across the internet to another machine. That machine's querying its database, returning putting that number inside an HTML response and sending that back across the internet to the browser. This happens to be happening on the same machine, but you guys could equally do this if you put this machine on the internet. Okay? And that's what you got there. OK, we only have about, is that right? Yeah, that's right. OK, so we only have a couple minutes left. 
Um, so what we're going to do next is we're going to display this info, uh, the actual news post information. We have an array of that. We just haven't grabbed the size, but let's display the information about that. Okay. Now, I'm going to use a method called each, okay, which is on an array. Um, the way I learned this to, to use methods like each, uh, there's a couple more that are, take a similar kind of format. Is I didn't really understand what was going on in, in the syntax. I just followed it along, and then it wasn't until like a year or two later I actually understood how the method was being called. Okay, I, I recommend unless you're like a real hardcore, really hardcore programmer and you want to look this up, you do the same. Okay, just follow along the syntax, get used to the syntax, uh, and I will say a little blurb about what's happening. But if you don't understand what that little blurb is, don't worry, just follow along the syntax. Okay, because you'll you'll get by. You'll, you'll do a lot of methods like this. Okay. OK, so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to type the Ruby code so you guys know what it looks like, and then I'll insert it into, into here, OK? So I'm just going to type in some Ruby code here in the comments, OK? So what the, the Ruby code is going to look like is this. There's a method you can call on an array called each, OK? And it looks like this. So the way this, this uh, works is you basically you call a method on an array called dot each, okay? And then you have this kind of do end structure. Okay, and the way this do end structure works is you can kind of basically picture this like as a method that's gonna run for each news post. Okay, whatever is inside the do end block is gonna run for the news post. So if you do a put s or whatever, da 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 this and that, it's gonna run for each news post. And the way you reference each news post inside that method is whatever you name the variable here. Okay, so this is kind of like a method. It's like do uh, parameters and end. Okay, so it's, it's like an anonymous method. Okay, those from, those who are familiar with JavaScript, you'll definitely know what's going on here. Okay, you're you're effectively passing in a method as an argument into this each method. Okay, this the way this actual this the the actual method, and this is a little blurb. If you don't understand, don't worry about it, OK? But the, the syntax of the method is kind of like this, OK? That's the method signature. It, it's a method on an array, and it takes a block of code. And that block of code is a method, OK? So much in programming, we're used to passing around variables and data. You can, there's nothing stopping you in programming languages from actually passing around methods. OK, C Sharp supports it. I think Java supports it. JavaScript definitely supports it. And Ruby supports it. OK, you can actually pass entire methods around to ask parameters. And the way you do, one, of the, one of the ways you do that in Ruby is this do end block. OK, so the way you can see this is that this do end block is really a parameter to the each method. OK, and the implementation of the each method is it's going to run that method that you pass in. Okay, on each one of the news posts, and this is going to be the variable name in that. Okay, if that doesn't make sense, all you have to know is that that's the syntax for how you do a for each loop. Okay, it's kind of cool because it's just a method on an array versus other languages that use for each methods. Sorry, for each the constructs. It's actually a completely new construct that they had to create for the language. This is just a, another method that happens to exist on the array class. Okay, it's a pretty cool way to implement it. Okay, what does this do something look like? Okay, if it was Ruby code, you could do stuff like this, you know, news post dot title, okay, and like news post dot body, something like that. Okay, but we are gonna mix and match Ruby with HTML. That's the brilliance of ERB. We can put HTML as the body of our loop, okay, and it'll run that. Okay, so this is what it generally looks like a, Ru a Ruby uh, each method on an array. Let's do it in the HTML format, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do this. Okay, so this is how you do control blocks in ERB. You surround anything that's specifically Ruby, like each and end, if and if else, all that, you surround in embedded Ruby tags, okay? Then in the middle, it's up to you. You can use Ruby code, or you can use HTML code, or you can use a mixture of both. Okay, and I'm going to use a mixture of both. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a paragraph for each one of these news posts. Okay. 
Okay, so you can see um, what's happening here is that for every one of these news posts, it's going to create these paragraph tags. Okay, inside the paragraph, I'm going to put the body. Less than percent equals at newspost.body percent greater than. Okay, so remember, this is part of the do end block. So that's this news post being passed into here. And then I'm going to put the title as a header too. Okay, because normally you have header two, close header two, and you put like some text in there, right? But the place we're getting that text from is from the actual news post. Okay, that's how we do embedded Ruby. Rather than you manually typing out the HTML, grab the data from some Ruby from Ruby variable and output it to the HTML document. Okay, that's why the equal signs are there. Okay, and that whole HTML piece is actually going to run for every news post. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. What do we got here? Each on nil class. Okay, well, can somebody tell me what I typed wrong there? Plural, exactly. Okay, because the variable's wrong. Like, we don't actually have a variable called news post. At news post, sorry. Okay. Now, again, conventionally, there's nothing wrong with typing my news posts or news post listing or something like that as your variable, right? It's just a refer refer referencing a variable, okay? And there we go. But now you can see how this page is dynamically rendering. And now you can see how if I add more and more news posts, I don't have to recode this page. I'll just add them, right? Whatever's in the database. Okay, this is where web programming starts to get dynamic. Okay, and this is where web programming really starts to level the playing field with regular programming, okay? I really don't like when people say, like, you're just a web programmer. Because <laughs> web programmers probably understand more than actually regular programmers because they started as web, uh, regular programmers and went to work. I'm going to get a lot of flack from the web community. But again, the two or three people, or not the web community, the desktop community. The two or three people, I'm sure, will not complain. OK, any questions? Cool. OK, so again, next week, uh, back in J0106. Shopify will be giving a talk, definitely worth your time. Uh, and then the week after is reading week. You pointed that out, right? Thanks for that. And then the week after, we're back to regular classes, and we'll be fleshing this out, OK? Uh, if you haven't watched the other videos, please watch them, OK? Getting to know Ruby, embedded ERB, stuff like that, that'll really help in the next little bit, OK? But we've coded one action. We'll be doing this for the next, uh, next uh, six actions, OK? Uh, if you guys need me, I'll be outside the door here because it looks like there might be a class in here right after us. So, thanks.